Digital Public History Center out of the department. Uh, I'm welcoming everyone to the first of our Clio Society public lectures for 2015-2016. Uh, the Clio Society is a public lecture series that connects the Department of History faculty to the wider community. Among its goals, the Clio Society seeks to promote the lifelong learning of history for personal enrichment and to engage students, colleagues, and friends in the exchange of information and ideas about history outside of the realm of traditional academic classes and seminars. This is our first time in a venue outside of the Ohio State campus, which is an effort on our part to reach out even farther into the community in which we serve. And the Department of History in particular takes the land grant mission of the university very seriously. And I hope you'll see the Clio Society as an expression of that commitment. If you visit clio.osu.edu, you can see videos of our previous lectures. And as you can see, we're recording this lecture this evening. Uh, I also note that our next lecture in the series will be on Thursday, December 10th, same time, same room. Uh, my colleague, Professor Vegeta Solon, will be presenting Growing Up in Ohio uh, Orphanages in the 20th Century. And I understand there are flyers in the back. We also have our email list if you're interested in uh, information about upcoming lectures, uh, notifications when our uh, videos are, uh, are up on the web. We can, uh, we can email those to you and nothing else. That's we only email uh, information about our events. Uh, two alumni of our department are the driving forces behind the Clio Society, neither of whom were able to join us this evening, Stephen Millett and Craig Zimper, both of whom have a passion for history that I know is shared by everyone in this room. Steve has said of the Clio Society that if you loved history as an undergraduate, you're going to love it now. And I know that when you leave here this evening with that feeling, uh, I know that you're going to leave uh, this evening feeling that way, especially after you hear our lecture for the evening, uh, who is Christopher Otter, Professor Christopher Otter, who joined our department in 2007. He is a specialist in modern British history with a focus on the history of science, technology, and public health, environmental history, and the history of food. His first book was titled The Victorian Eye, A Political History of Light and Vision in Britain. And he's currently completing the book The Vital State, Food Systems, Nutrition, Transitions, and the Making of Industrial Britain, from which he draws for his lecture this evening. In addition to his research, Chris is an award-winning teacher, and I think you'll understand why, when he presents for us this evening, Devouring the Earth, How British Food Changed the Earth. Chris Otter. Thank you. Well, thank you all for, for coming out this evening, um, particularly to listen to this um, uh, and to look at pictures. Um, hold on a second. This still is. Oh, here we go. But pictures like this. Um, when we look at this steak and kidney pie, you might not want to dwell on it too long. You might ask what does a historian to make of something like this. Um, now, towards the end of his book, The First World War, an agrarian interpretation, Abner Offer refers to um, the white flour, the refined sugar, the processed fats and frozen meat, the cheap imported staples that have given Britain the worst dietary heritage in, in Europe. And I'm celebrating it tonight with my RC. <laughs> um, but ridicule is easy, um, perhaps unavoidable. But um, harder still is to write an actual serious history of things like pies and crisps and candy, um, but it's in these foods that the, uh, the calories that powered the British Industrial Revolution ultimately um, derived, and these foodstuffs deserve serious consideration. They're actually intertwined with, with numerous very significant uh, historical developments, historical developments which are anything but trivial. Um, for example, and the history of globalization, the history of ecology, history of biological transformation, by the sub meaning of uh, livestock and crops, the history of food security, and the history of the human body. My human body is currently being annihilated. <laughs> <laughs> now, if we are to sort of ask, what are the sort of basic contours of the transition here? This is sometimes called the nutrition transition. Since approximately 1750, we see Dietary transition in Britain and much of the Western world and the developing world taking the form of a rising consumption of animal proteins, 
Um, refined grains, particularly wheat, sugar, and dairy products, a generally rising level of calorific intake. This together is called the, the nutrition transition, and it's become, in a sense, inseparable from development. For good or ill, pretty much any country or any part of the world undergoing um, economic development goes to this nutrition transition. Okay, and if we look at this map, this is just a map giving some indication of the rising income of sh uh, consumption of sugar in the UK since about 1700. And as you can see, there is a startling kind of upshift um, from around 1850. The transition was initially limited to urban areas, but by 1900 it radiated across much of the British Isles. This dietary complex was often associated, I kid you not, with masculine vigor, with racial supremacy, and with economic power. Men, for example, ate differently to women. They ate more meat. Women ate more, ate more proportionally more carbohydrates. In the 20th century, this becomes the diet, as I say again, of, of development. So huge generalizations. We can make a huge, hang on a second, a huge sweeping generalization. We're talking about a shift in a diet towards a rise in simple refined carbohydrates, sugars, animal proteins, dairy products. We can also add alcohol and caffeine to this, uh, but I'm not going to talk about those today. Rising calorific consumption. So what is the significance? What happened? Let's start with the very, very big picture. Um, First of all, Britain outsources foods to a vastly greater extent than any other European country, or major European country, in the 19th century. By 1914, for example, Britain imports 80% of its wheat. This diagram from 1884 gives you some sense of the kind of discrepancy between uh, the, the wheat consumed and wheat produced. You can already see that Britain is only producing 50% of its wheat in the 1880s. And this is very, very different to pretty much every other country listed here. Britain develops the world's biggest food deficit. In 1860, 49% of all food produced in Asia, Africa, and Latin America that crossed the national border went to Britain. In 1884, for example, Britain imported 10 times as much dead meat as anywhere else in Europe. So this is an economically unique trajectory. And this food deficit, in turn, generated, stimulated the British shipping industry and the economies of the so-called Neo-Europe. So these are sort of temperate areas, Australasia, Canada, North America, Argentina. This is a picture of an Argentine meatworks. By the 1930s, 90% of Argentina's beef exports went to Britain. You can tell a similar story for New Zealand, in the form of sheep, Denmark in the form of bacon, Canada in the form of wheat. When we look at world cattle population, this is in around the 1920s, we can see that there's been a gigantic diaspora of cattle into these parts of the world. British people move globally, British capital move globally, British animals move globally too. This was a process of evolutionary history. Human, humans driving evolution. There's no, obviously no, reason, good reason why Argentina should be so full of cattle. Argentinian beef, New Zealand lamb, Danish bacon were all produced from animals originally exported from Britain, crossbred for the purposes of producing meat tailored for British taste. So the British are sending their animals as a gene flow of, uh, of animal gene flow from Britain to these Neo-Europes. The techniques in turn produced new cattle breeds. Here's some Hereford cattle with the trademark white face. These didn't exist on Earth until the very late 18th century. And this was pretty soon folded into evolutionary biology. Mendelian ideas were applied to animals well before they were applied to people. If you read a textbook on animal breeding in the early 20th century, I'm sure that's what you all like to do every <laughs> evening, you will come across some fairly ruthless statements of, of eugenics, the ruthless elimination of the unfit. These sort of cattle breeding societies, this is where real genetic <laughs> eugenics happened. In a very, very short period of time, cattle and pigs and sheep are consciously remade to serve very particular human needs. 
Extinction was accelerated, with one author actually using the expression bovine historical time to contextualize the phenomenon. So what we get is humans selecting animals with certain characteristics and consciously transforming the global bovine, ovine, and porcine germlines. The Danes, it was said, and I quote, produce pigs with the same precision and efficiency as Mr. Ford produces his motor cars or Mr. Waterman his fountain pens. And here is a, a Danish land race pig with its nice legs. It wasn't just a question of breeding, it's also a question of feeding. Um, traditionally, animals are first fed for basic growth, or for, were first fed for basic growth, and then were fattened. And what you get is meat that contains uh, a large amount of protein, and then a big layer of fat around the outside. Modern techniques intermingle the two through the phenomenon of marbling. This is an extremely marbled form of Japanese Kobe beef. Um, now we get the sort of intermingling of fat and protein. This is there's no natural reason why animal flesh should look like this when you cut it up. Animal life is accelerated, and it's also telescoped. Animals live fast and die young. Bovine life becomes completely shaped by the food system, the conception often coming via artificial insemination. As one wag put it in the 1950s, I am sorry for cows who have to boast of affairs they've had by parcel post. <laughs> and the genetic consequence of this is what geneticists call a, um, a sort of bottlenecking of so-called effective population size. If, if certain uh, bulls are ultimately siring thousands, even millions of calves, then there's a homogenization of the germline. And this is not necessarily um, an environmentally good thing. We can tell a similar story with sugar and a similar story with wheat. Red Fife and Marquis wheat were the products of conscious selection and hybridization in North America, in Canada in particular. The prairie landscape of Canada in by the 1920s and 30s became one of the most ecologically um, homogenous monocultural places on earth. In some areas, 90% of all crops growing are wheat, and that's an astonishing, historically astonishing statistic. Apologies for my sipping my RC cola. The so productivity is increased by making nature work harder, work faster, work better. Uh, it makes life itself a powerful vector of capital accumulation. You make a lot more money if your cattle are growing quickly and being killed young. The formation of world markets in evolutionary enhanced materials is the story here. This helped Britain escape the endless cycle of famines that we see in the medieval and early modern period. However, it instituted new forms of food insecurity into both Britain and outside the British mainland. Sen famously called such famines entitlement crises. They're not caused by absolute lack of food, but a lack of purchasing power. This is seen in peripheral zones of Britain, the British Isles, and the British Empire. The mortality rate during the Great Irish Famine, for example, was higher than pretty much any recorded famine on Earth. Ireland, as some of you may know, is the only part of Europe whose population is lower than it was in the early 1840s. Many parts of Ireland, the west of Ireland, the south, lacked a market economy, lacked food reserves. When the potato failed, available food supply gravitated to areas where purchasing power existed, the wealthy in north, northeast of Ireland and the mainland. Relief in the form of public works and soup kitchens was fairly minimal. Now, David Nally, a historian of 19th century Ireland, has recently argued this catastrophe gave the British the opportunity to restructure the socio-economic framework of Ireland. A poor vindicated by contemporary descriptions from Britain that this famine was a blessing and the accelerated institutionalization of British poor law apparatus into Ireland. In other words, this is an early example of what um, Naomi Klein has called disaster capitalism. It's a, it's, a, it's a crisis within a capitalist system that's used as an excuse to force through drastic social change. In this case, the obliteration of two million people. Obviously, a million people uh, left to, to emigrate to Britain um, and America. So the nutrition transition then offered the British an opportunity 
to restructure the economy of Ireland and get rid of surplus population through a project of enforced depotatoization. This process is also evident in India. Um, although India suffered the same cycle of pre-modern famines as the West, the slow and uneven integration of Indian wheat production into world markets and British markets in particular, together with the dismantling of an old system of public granaries, created a series of shocks and calamities, particularly when these inter interwove with droughts. There were 10 major famines in India between 1837 and 1900, including the giant famines of the late 1870s and 1890s. The economist repeatedly blamed this on the idea that we're trying to introduce development into a place which was accustomed, accustomed to stationariness, something we know to be demonstrably false. India was every bit as progressive as Britain prior to the 19th century economically. The remedies here, it's the same as Ireland, it involves the institution of camps. And the British, whenever they found themselves in trouble in their empire, they built camps. And they ultimately invented concentration camps out of this. Um, this is the construction of an infrastructure as well, an economic infrastructure, which actually funneled food away from places that needed it to people who could actually buy it. The consequences were the same massive humanitarian crisis. In this case, it's between 10 and 20 million deaths in the last few decades of, of the century. Again, this nutrition transition involves letting a lot of people die. We've got a slow polarization of the planet into zones typified by overconsumption and zones blighted by permanent hunger and food insecurity. The Irish and Indian famines are quite clearly examples of the fate of what we call today the bottom billion in a global economy, a society existing on the precarious fault line between market and moral economy, and ultimately possessing the characteristics of neither, neither effective markets nor systems of social protection. So it's a sort of new kinds of vulnerability introduced into food systems. Okay, um, switch gears here. This is like one of those abrupt ruptures you get in lectures from the horrible to the well, to another kind of horrible. <laughs> <laughs> On the British mainland, throughout this period, we get an increasingly cemented British diet of meat and potatoes, white bread and dairy products and sugary tea. <coughs> Regional varieties persisted. This is a Bedfordshire clanger. If anyone's ever eaten one of these things, it's a long kind of roly-poly with like half meat pie, half apple pie. So you get through the meat bit and then your, then your dessert starts. <laughs> 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 The successful mobilization of calories in this kind of food, of course, did not produce inter internationally recognized cuisine. <laughs> British food has fewer, fewer regional varieties than other EU countries. It, it, Italy, for example, has 149 protected foods. Britain has a mere 29. And the Bedfordshire Center is not one of them. <laughs> Quite welcome to copy it. Um, British cooking had long been associated with simplicity, with economy or blandness. Well done meat and soggy vegetables were well established norms before 1800, as was an aversion to garlic, as the same when the English have three vegetables, two of which are cabbage. <laughs> but, and this is important, calorific intake is, is rising. Hold on a second. I'll get back to this in a minute. Calorific intake is, is rising. Over the long term, the increasing number of available calories power the Industrial Revolution. It may not be that they came in a particularly culinarily attractive form, but they were the petrol driving the motor of industrialization. Uh, it's been estimated by economic historians that the combination of bringing the very poor into the labor force, raising the amount of calories they consumed, making them available for work, can explain probably around 20 to 30 percent of all growth in per capita income over the past 200 years. So this stuff might look unpleasant, but it's economically extremely Significant. But was this sustainable? We begin to get some of the first concerns about the sustainability of a diet so heavy in wheat and sugar and meat. In 1898, William Crookes, who was a probably Britain's preeminent chemist at the time, wrote a pamphlet called The Wheat Problem, in which he raised serious concerns about the future of this system. He was adamant that, with well, rising world population, 
A weak consumption together with a diminishing amount of good lands was threatening a Malthusian crisis. He thought that chemistry might prevent a food crisis, the development of high yielding and disease resistant varieties of wheat and pesticides, mechanization of dry farming allowed the chemical and geographical limits to be breached. Here we see a map from the world's food resources in 1919 showing the extent to which it was projected that wheat farming could push northwards into Canada, again through selective breeding. And indeed, world wheat production increased by around 20% between 1910 and 1932. In other words, this Malthusian moment was lost. By the 1920s, we have renewed and revivified cornucopianism, of which world's food resources was perhaps the pinnacle of how on earth could the planet start when Perthshire and Scotland was overproducing raspberries. Less cosmic, but perhaps more practical, was what to do during wartime. By 1914, Britain is the, is the world's least dietarily self-sufficient major nation. By some distance, 80% of wheat was imported. Practically all British sugar was imported. Most cheese, most butter, even at 35% of eggs were imported. The strategic consequences of this are pretty stark. Without maintaining international supply lines, particularly American ones, starvation was imminent. As a nation, we stand unique in the history of the world for our entire and utter dependence on outside sources for the means of feeding our densely populated country. Our commerce is both the source of our wealth and the origin of our weakness. We are vulnerable in the very part of our system from which our greatness springs. Blackwood's magazine described this as an eternally suspended sword of Damocles. There was a royal commission on the supply of food and raw materials in time of war, 1903 to 1905. This concluded that Britain would still feed herself during wartime. The more self-sufficient Germans saw Britain's food situation as a major weakness. In 1912, Admiral von Breusing stated, in the case of war with Great Britain, the interception of British food supplies must become one of our first objects. But Britain basically slept walked into World War I thinking it could just get through on its imports as long as it maintained friendly supply lines with America. When war broke out, panic buying and queues followed. One woman apparently bought 270 pounds of food in a single day, including 144 pots of jam. <laughs> By 1918, the situation was completely reversed. The British state effectively took control of the entire food supply. This kind of laissez-faire economic liberal system has been inverted. The, the state acts as buyer, sets maximum prices, orchestrates distributions, subsidizes some foods like bread and rations others. Military innovation followed, naval innovation, convoys, depth charges, hydrophones, dazzle painting. The government exhorted its citizens to economize, bombarded them with pamphlets, how to say and why. Suggested that citizens collect acorns and chestnuts and go gleaning. The British state also penalized wasteful acts, extravagance in Manchester. Um, people were actually fined for <coughs> feeding their dogs meat or throwing chips on a fire. Following several local initiatives, national rationing began in 1918, but it's important to note that bread was never rationed and was not rationed in World War II until the very end. In The Great War and the British People, a famous book by the Yale historian Jay Winter, he argued famously that domestic standards of living actually rose during the war. The British state was clearly willing to intervene heavily to maintain basic nutritional needs in mainland Britain, contrast its approach to Ireland and India, where market forces are seen as a pure remedy for crisis, and if ever anyone sort of tells you that free markets solve everything, just ask them what did America and Britain do during the world wars. They drop the free market immediately and take control of something as vitally important as food. Winter's thesis suggests that a more socially egalitarian diet, or even a less refined one, had benefits for human health. So, in the final part of this class, what were the benefits of human health? Was this a good thing or a bad thing for the human body? Well, it's quite clear that the average Westerner, about the average person pretty much globally, has increased in height dramatically and unprecedentedly in the last 150 years. This is the first time since the, um, the Paleolithic that we've been this tall. We've actually finally broken through our original paleo limits. And one of the most obvious reasons for this is 
diets. Now this raises the spectre of the so-called Thomas McCown thesis. Most of you won't be familiar with this. Um, McCown, basically in a series of books, famously argued that rising, that, sorry, that falling modern mortality rates in the West were caused by improved nutrition. This, these books are written in the, in the 60s and 70s. And that medical intervention, public health, plays no role. Effectively, fundamentally, almost no role in this. Um, McCown's thesis has been subject to a battery of critique since it first appeared, sort of 40 or 50 years ago, and it's quite clear that he downplayed the role of public health and sanitation. But nonetheless, recent work with the changing body by Flood and Fogel and others have suggested that some of this thesis is salvageable. Diet transformation was slow, it was uneven, but it's clear that rising calorific intakes plus early 20th century dietary diversification did one thing, and that's improved maternal nutrition. There are simply more calories available for women, better health for them, improved the health and survivability of infants and children, whose better health then enabled hard work and improvement. This is an autocatalytic cycle. This improved nutrition certainly improved resistance to some diseases, notably tuberculosis, which are responsible <coughs> to fluctuations in environmental conditions. The body remade by the nutrition transition then was bigger, stronger, and more resistant to infectious diseases. As Winter concludes, there is a momentum in British demographic graphic history which is the product of slow and cumulative change in the adequacy of the diet of the working population. Okay, so McCown, that smirk is probably appropriate, but I'm going to wipe it off his face now. Um, sorry, Thomas. Um, the body remade by the nutrition transition was also vulnerable to a whole set of new morbidities, novel health conditions which had existed before on Earth, but were very rare. These things regarded as being a product of a new dietary milieu, a milieu characterized by refined synthetic artificial foodstuffs, a disjuncture between the body and its dietary environment. This is connected to the so-called nutrition as uh, lifestyle diseases or diseases of civilization, as um, Plimmer and Plimmer, two Plimmers, put it in 1925, civilization has made it too easy to get the wrong foods of all kinds. Difficult to get the foods we ought to eat. Natural foodstuffs form but a small part of the present day diet because they have for convenience been replaced by less perishable foods. This sugary, starchy British diet was blamed, and I quote again, for the decay of man, the decay of his teeth, his arteries, his bowels, and his joints on a colossal and unprecedented scale. Now some of this is rhetoric, but I think we can find some of this anchored in reality. White bread and sugary cakes were causing expanding waistlines and clogged bowels of what the doctor Alan Long called a nation of constipated toothless fatties. <laughs> <laughs> Transformed diets left its mark at every point in its journey through the body. Now, this is a diet that's been largely divested of fiber that's been largely divested, or significantly divested, of, of water. First and foremost, to begin the journey with the British teeth. You've all heard this sort of cliche about British teeth, they're not very good. Well, this is the way a lot of dentists in Britain felt in the early 20th century. Harry Campbell, in 1936, estimated there were 100 million diseased teeth in Britain. The British have the worst teeth in the world, he said. The condition beggars description. It should excite him as a feeling of shame and humiliation, and a fixed determination to mend our ways and remedy the evil. The average British mouth, he continued, contained a perfectly ghastly series of decaying fangs. Mm -hmm. Now we see here not just tooth decay, but rising incidents of inflamed gums or pyorrhea. This was then linked to various forms of sickness and decay. This father, his breath is so bad that his child literally can't look him in the face. <laughs> now prey to every disease. Your toothbrushes were actually a symptom of the problem, not a remedy. They're a symptom of degeneration. And I quote again, it would be just as much flying in the face of nature to brush our stomachs as to brush our mouths. In other words, you're just using technology to remedy a problem caused by technology. Moreover, the removal of fiber from the British diet meant that British jaws were narrowing and weakening and malocclusion was increasing in incidence, and this narrowing of the jaw was, was something that anthropologists got very obsessed about in the early 20th century. William Rushton, I quote, we're becoming an ugly nation. 
the round, well-balanced face giving place to the long, thin one. And there's obviously hyperbole here. This is obviously a, a rhetoric that's obviously bound up with, with theism, degeneration, and so forth. But we also have hard evidence. If we, if we look at skeletal studies, clearly suggests that increased use of refined foods has generated greater levels of caries, dental abscesses, and periodontal disease, and a great rise in the use of false teeth. Man without teeth, man with artificial teeth. Look at him now. <laughs> the transformation in the Western diet appeared to produce bodily effects which were rare or non-existent in places which had not undergone the nutrition transition. Conditions here like appendicitis, diverticulitis, these, are, these anthropological accounts are full of the fact that quote unquote primitive races don't suffer from these diseases and there are sort of loving descriptions of the, the shape of their stools in comparison to ones produced in, in Britain. And, and this, this sort of focus on school, stools reaches its pinnacle in what we might call the great constipation scare of the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, <laughs> Those of you in my class today have already been through this once, so this is the only day of your life you'll ever listen to a professor talk about constipation twice. The constipation, was, it was argued, was the, the paradigmatic disease of civilization, caused by sedentary habits, lack of fiber, lack of water, corsets, modesty, squalid, cold, and uncomfortable toilets. And apocalyptic predictions abounded W. R. Butthnot Lane, in particular, described the, uh, uh, the, the overburdened colon as a slow poison factory, or a cesspit, which eventually becomes twisted and kinked. In the culture of the abdomen, Hornibrook, F. A. Hornibrook, stated, the hollow abdominal viscera are crowded like a bag of anglers' worms into the lower part of the abdomen pelvis. The result, according to R. Butthnot Lane, was something called into uh, auto-intoxication, which is what happens when you simply don't evacuate your stools regularly enough these things, the stools eventually produce poisons that infiltrate your bloodstream and lead to a cascade of problems. Everything from cancer to shell shock, I kid you not. The cures for such intestinal poisoning were manifold. Various forms of, of exercise were important here. Suppositories, massaging equipment, laxatives, fibrous foods, this is where we get the whole bread reform movement in Britain. For those of you who've been to Britain, you'll notice things like Hovis, Allinson bread. They date from this time, and they are marketed just like Kellogg's foods in the United States as aids to digestion. Hovis comes from hominis vis, or strength of man. The fiber wars were underway. At a 1927 talk at Liverpool University, our government lane arrived flanked by students carrying whole wheat loaves impaled on sticks. <laughs> Lane went further. This was not enough for him. He actually advocated and practiced a variety of surgical procedures involving the removal of significant lengths of bowel. The colectomy was his favorite. He was one of the world's most skilled surgeons, and he removed probably around a thousand intestines over the course of his career. One British medical editor grumbled, if this rage for colectomy continued, an intestine of the normal length will soon be as rare as an appendix. Meanwhile, the British having their appendix, appendices removed. Hang on a second, that's something else. <laughs> <laughs> Laxative use remained high. My grandmother took two Senna pills every Tuesday and Friday until her death in 2001. Constipation, recalled the cookery writer Jane Grigson, hung over some families like a mushroom cloud. Now this scare, reveals deep anxieties about the body and its relationship with rapidly changing nutrition. Scares which, which had real impact on the body, but also had a lot of impact on the mind and psychology. In the 19th century, another way in which this manifested itself was a novel form of food refusal or appetite, largely practiced by middle-class girls with no sign of insanity or organic illness. The British physician, William Gull, who was Queen Victoria's physician, He's, he's a kind of left field candidate for being Jack the Ripper as well. Um, <laughs> diagnosed this and used the term anorexia nervosa in English for the first time in 1874, meaning loss of appetite with a nervous origin rather than a hysterical or uterine origin. The precise number of girls and women 
Suffering from anorexia then as now remains controversial, reflecting the illness's various components, its cultural, biological, and psychological dimensions, which are all inseparable from the complex. The causes of the emergence of anorexia nervosa are very, very complex. They do reflect changing gender roles, reconfiguration of bourgeois family dynamics, and so forth. But there's an important connection to the nutrition transition. Almost all cultures historically, anthropology tells us this, have maintained some form of gendered patterns of consumption. But in the 19th century, these distinctions were normalized in, in four ways, I think, in, in Britain. And I think this applies to the United States, too. First of all, the prescription of very different calorific levels for men and women. Men were supposed to eat more than women. Women were supposed to eat less. The naturalization also of a more carb-rich female diet. The increase, increasing pervasive equation of beauty and thinness. The sort of increasing vilification of obesity. And also an increasing torrent of literature aimed at women and young girls, which told them in no uncertain terms, repeatedly, that expressing a vigorous diet, particularly in public, was unladylike, unladylike and disgusting. Women, in short, ate less calories, and they were taught to be ashamed of eating, yet, paradoxically, what they actually ate was more likely to make them fat, particularly when, when mingled with me metabolic differences between men and women. This produces an absolutely toxic combination of anorak anorexic logic that runs right through 19th century society and we're still utterly enmeshed in it today. Now a more obvious connection exists with, with obesity. Obesity has a long history and the older notion associating it with vigor and manliness which lasted until the 18th century did not disappear. John Bull transformed into a scarecrow. Could we live over such a disgrace? States one publication in the 1860s. But concerns were rising. You get reports of stagecoach drivers struggling to accommodate particularly corpulent individuals. Apparently one, uh, one um, guy was told that he had to go and, and be measured as lumber and carried in a lumber truck instead of being in a, in a, in a stagecoach where he actually just wasted himself and refused to move. The British were considered the fattest people in the world in the 19th century. American commentators coming to Britain routinely observed <coughs> The first thing that strikes an American in England is the number of inordinately fat people, stated Silas Weir Mitchell in 1877. An increasing number of individuals in Britain kept journals, and we can look at these journals and see that anxiety about weight is appearing. We see the proliferation of remedies, diets of brown bread and tea, pills of oil of violet with melted beef suet. Key text was William Banting's letter on corpulence, Banting was an undertaker, he made the Duke of Wellington's coffin, but as he develops in age, he also found himself putting on um, many pounds. He lost 35 pounds by renouncing sugars and starches. I had left off using Botox, and other such aids which were indispensable, being now able to stoop with ease and freedom un unnecessary. I had lost the feeling of occasional faintness, and what I think a remarkable blessing and comfort I had been able safely to leave off knee bandages, which I'd worn necessarily for 20 past years, and I'd given up a truss almost entirely. Lucky William. <laughs> <laughs> what we see here is one of the very first diets that said it's not about how much you eat, it's about what you eat, and here it's carbs that are being attacked. And this is not actually dissimilar to the Atkins diet. There are multiple kind of proto-Atkins diets we see in the 19th century in, in Britain and Germany in the United States. There was an increasing collective awareness that British waistlines were expanding in the early 20th century. Obesity, like constipation, was associated with what one doctor called the rise of homo sedentarius. Hobson, J. A. Hobson, the uh, social theorist, connected obesity with a theory of parasites earning Rent. But in truth, obesity was democratizing. This was no longer the, the rich elites. This was, this was society. By 1953, the British Medical Association concluded that obesity is the commonest nutritional disease in present-day Britain. So the nutrition transition then, coupled with developments in public health administration, reshaped morbidity and mortality patterns, making it inseparable from the epidemiologic transition, a, a decline in deaths from infectious and contagious diseases, a rise in deaths from so-called 
lifestyle diseases. In other words, what we're getting is people are living longer, but they're spending more of those years being sick. By the 1950s, heart disease was the biggest killer in the Western world, and there are obvious connections to this history too. In other words, to go back to McKeown, this is a more nuanced and ambivalent story. It's not simply a story of, of calories liberating us from, from, uh, from disease. It's also a case of calories liberating us and constraining us in other ways. So when we return to uh, these foodstuffs, right, they're, we, we can laugh at them. They're, they're less, they are objects of ridicule. This is an attractive pack of frozen foods. Um, but they're also artifacts of a deep transformation in, in how Britain related um, to the world, to animals, to energy, um, to the body. The Industrial Revolution is now widely agreed to be one of the most important global phenomena of the last 10 to 12 millennia. Its magnitude is only just beginning to be felt today when we suddenly realize that we are living in the Anthropocene, threatened with climate change. The most palpable evidence of this change is our bodies, is our transformed morbidity, mortality patterns, our transformed heights and weights. This is the result of a diet that's ultimately become entirely powered by fossil fuels. So when Britain shifted to a diet of white bread, sugar, processed fats, and frozen meat, it shifted to an industrialized diet, a diet reliant upon the global economy, upon food manufacturing systems, and one equally reliant on the biological transformation of cows, pigs, sheep, wheat, and sugar. This industrial diet and this industrial body have since become the primary pathway through which there's a generalized global project of development inseparable now from neoliberalism or global capitalism is an unsustainable project at a global level. These technological and dietary transitions have also produced a very different human body to any body previously in history, a very different set of morbidity and mortality patterns. Now it would be reductive and ridiculous to blame Britain solely for this, but I think it would also be erroneous to, as most commentators do, simply blame this on post-1945 America. It's played a central role in a deeper history of contemporary anxieties about diet, the body, and the planet. In other words, thinking about the nutrition <coughs> like this is a, is a very good way to link British history to world history and ultimately the future fate of our body and planet. Thank you. and Europeans regarding this as, as the epitome of, of evil. And it's clearly not the latter. There, there can be issues with GM food, with, with, with the sort of homogenization and genes and, and seeds escaping into other fields and so forth. But the idea that we're creating Franken foods by doing this, I think is, is hopelessly overblown. I don't think there's really that much evidence that the GM foods are, I think there are lots of things to worry about about food. And also GM foods can be enormously helpful in some parts of the world, even though there are complexities about this. There are, there are, I think it's more, in a sense, it's not the GM foods themselves, it's more the corporate control of them that tends to be the problem. So it's sort of, in a sense, if you're saying to a certain part of, for example, Africa, is some genetically modified crops which will grow in marginal croplands that is particularly dry and drought prone, that's that's great, but if you have to buy in into Monsanto's policy of, of buying the seeds every single year mm -hmm. and becoming chained to also using a whole bunch of pesticides and fertilizers and so on that themselves are problematic for the land, and then that's an issue. So GM food often is inseparable from 
what's perceived to be various forms of American colonialism, and, and that's a different issue. But GM food itself, I don't think, is terribly problematic. So, unlike everything else. Yes? A great deal of uh, information that changes constantly. Mm -hmm. And it's very tough to keep up with. Right. The most recent stuff that I've read is whole milk is fine. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, but better two percent. Better than two, better than better than skim milk. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's just uh, two months ago. Right yeah, it's a lot of the papers at the moment. And what do you cook with that? Um, I drink this stuff instead. <laughs> <laughs> I, honestly, I think that I think there are. I mean, if, if you in terms of dietary guidelines, there are the basic guidelines. I would, I think that I would try and live by or avoid processed food as much as you can okay. and avoid sugars okay. and don't worry too much about the rest. Okay. Okay. So, drink lots of RC cold. <laughs> I'm only drinking, I mean, I'm, I'm already feeling the, the decay of man on the cross. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I think the cross, book cross, cross, cross. China diet. So okay. A lot of what you say. Mm -hmm. I haven't read that book yet, so. No, it's, it's very much. Right. I mean, the, China is going through a very, very accelerated version of this. Of this right now, like it's going through accelerated industrialization. It's going through a very, very accelerated nutrition transition, and the yeah, meat consumption in China is now higher than the you know, per capita in absolute levels. So, it's not a good place to be a pig. <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent explanation of uh, the different medical problems. Right. 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 Jim. Um, so you just said that probably one of the best things to do is avoid processed food, processed sugar, that sort of stuff. And it strikes me that it's that while that's almost certainly true, it's very easy to say this sort of stuff. But the problem that we have in this society, and I think the problem we have in most of the Western worlds, is that avoiding processed food is something that you can only do if you're middle class. Yeah. Yeah, it's increasingly difficult. And and I'm wondering if you could give a historian's perspective on that. Like, how how did this come to be? Right. Um, and how long is it? You know? Yeah, I mean, it, what, it's it's a product of, of cheap when processed food becomes cheaper than non-processed foods, and we certainly see this in in evidence by for the British market in the early 20th century. And then what happens is in the 1930s. There's obviously a global economic collapse, but, but you've got this kind of system put in place. Governments everywhere on earth going to subsidize agriculture at that point. There's, there's, there was nowhere in the 1930s that wasn't being subsidized. So agriculture is now being kept afloat, and a cheap supply of food, often controlled by and, and part of a broader sort of corporate control of the food system. After World War II, this really, really cements. You've got corporations subsidized agriculture, and those two things together make processed foods cheaper than non-processed foods. So white bread is now cheaper than brown bread, which in the, historically, white bread was always more expensive because you have to take stuff out of it, and that takes effort, rather than just letting everything be mixed together. So, but this is, this is a kind of inversion. So it's a 20th century, it's got a longer 20th century history, and incredibly, there's two things, actually, that the other thing that's, that's connected to this, aside from subsidies, agricultural subsidies, is incredibly cheap energy. And once you can drive factories and refrigerated ships and trucks over, over distances mm -hmm. that, that are really no object in terms of price, then you can have very cheap processed food. So you get food that's, being, that's coming from the United States that's actually cheaper than something that's made up the road. The transport costs don't, don't matter. That's, that's going to end. I mean, that's, that's that. So the oil aspect of this is, is another part of the puzzle, which I think really gets into at the end. So does that help you answer? Yeah, very much. Okay. Yes? Uh, when is your next book coming out? Could you repeat the title? This book. Um, it's called, at the moment it's called The Vital States of Feeding Industrial Britain. But, but when it comes out, I'm sure it'll be costing the arts because publishers tell you what to call books. So and it is, it's going to be finished next summer. And if it's not finished next summer, I'm going to be in big trouble. <laughs> it's already quite late. So, so it will be, it'll hit the shelves in 2017. You know, you'll hear it. It'll be all over the, 
Um, pardon me if I wonder just a little bit here, but I wondered if um, you could speak about the greengrocer movement in in Britain and the perhaps the history of that and uh, kind of where you think it might be going. The I history of um, grocery stores, you, you mean? So the greengrocers, the ones right. that deal basically with things that aren't there more than a couple of days. Right. But, well, in in terms of in terms of, of um, produce, uh, as uh, as uh, as we call it in America, uh, fruit and veg, as we call it in, in Britain, um, this is. It depends on which fruit and veg you're talking about. What kind of supply lines are like? Because obviously, part, large parts of Britain still grow. We're still growing cabbages and broccoli and potatoes, and these things have relatively local markets. Potatoes in particular, but fruits string beans and various things have are imported. So, so that there are there are various different supply lines. Most in the in the 19th century, most fruit and veg is sold by a by a market, so sort of farmers markets as we call them now, often close to railway lines. And, and these things and, and then by the end of the day, anything that's left over will be sold extremely cheaply to anyone who wants to come and get it. Or you've also got barrow boys pushing barrows and these things around. The first supermarkets in Britain start in the sort of 1930s and 40s, really take up after 1950. In that intervening time, you're beginning to get small groups of multiple shops, so sort of chains beginning to sort of get into this area. Then after 1950, you've really got supermarkets taking over. So there's, a, there's an evolution there from railway markets and barrows to smaller chains to supermarkets. And now, just like here, a resurgence of those farmers markets that used to be where poor people went, now it's where yuppies go <laughs> on a Saturday morning uh, with their kids and a baby Bjorn. <laughs> Again, it's like bread. You know, bread used to be it used to be that white bread was the elite bread, now brown bread is the elite bread, and so the, these fashions are to a certain extent cyclical. So, yes. Um, I have a friend who, uh, a very educated person, somebody I respect a lot. Uh, we walked into the um, room in our building where we work, where there's uh, vending machines. Mm -hmm. And he pointed to the um, candy and the chips and, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, just the worst things in, in my right. opinion that you could eat. I haven't touched it since I've been there. And he just, he made an offhand remark. He said, oh, in about 15 years, all this is going to be illegal. What do you think about that comment? Um, I don't think it'll be illegal, but I, I, I think he's... I think um, there are people who would say this stuff is, is as bad as smoking um, and it's an addiction and we, we should get rid of it. But going back to, the, to one of the points from before, this has, been, this has been the place where incredibly cheap, incredibly dense, incredibly durable calories are found. This stuff's never going to rot. It'll still be the ill, you know, human civilization will die out. And there'll still be like candy bars lying around, and no bacteria can colonize whatsoever. So, and so being able to make the have these foods portable, durable, and practically everlasting, and to have like 200 calories in, in two bites, that this has been this is it, this is totally essential to the industrial revolution. This is the you know, when they, they do experiments on workers in the 19th century, and they they realize that you know if you eat a bit of some sugar, your productivity rate goes up. So you drop a tea break in, and what, what have you got? You've got candy, chocolate, sugary tea. This is the quickest way of getting calories into a body in the short space of time. It's fully digested. There's no residue. Everything goes into energy. And whatever your health issues, forget that. And um, unless we have some radical way of, of making life better for, for poor workers, we're still going to have this there because the people at the bottom are going to be eating like that to power development. Yes. What research have you found regarding education levels? Um, we teach in a high school, and we notice when the kids have sugar, et cetera, for lunch, the end of the day is ridiculous. Right. They can't think. Um, never mind energy. They, their brains don't work properly. Right. What has your research shown regarding? I understand the worker component of it. What about the education levels? In, in the um, in the early nineteenth century, in the early twentieth century, in the later nineteenth century, the general viewpoint from doctors about children consuming sugar was that sugar was great because it gave them it gave you quick energy and we were naturally born to have this we have a sweet tooth and, and there's, a, there's a sort of phase when when sugar is is seen as being 
as being almost like a perfect food. And particularly over the course of the 20th century, there's been more heavy subsidy of attacking fats and attacking meat than there has been of sugar in at least until relatively recently. The, the tide's turned now. And I think that most books that you read on diet say that sugar is, is the worst thing you can eat. And it, it's fairly hard to see any way back from that. I mean, fashions come and go, but no diet says eat more sugar, not a single one. So in terms of, and, and were you also asking about, about children themselves? And well, more they... of, uh, I don't know if you want to say IQ levels, or even the idea of, of education rates fluctuating. I haven't come across anything anything like that. My, my, my sense is, is that um, keeping children off, I mean, I've got two kids who are in school, one in third grade and one in kindergarten, and I, we, I limit the, the sugar that they consume, and they're frankly still a mess at the end of the day, but probably not as much of a mess as they, they would have been uh, had, they, had they consumed sugar. And I, I, I think dental education is, is one quite helpful point. I mean, when, if your children, my children become quite tooth conscious, and they, because of my lovely teeth, they're obviously, they're obviously modeling, modeling my teeth, they, um, they both try to make sure they don't get cavities, and actually some of them consciously have, have, have reduced the amount of candy. My older son has quit Halloween mm -hmm. as well. Um, partly, well, I hate Halloween. I'm like, I just, I just like right, I, I, no, I'm just saying, it's another story about Halloween, but, <laughs> but he, he found it oppressive, and you know, just swarms of children with these bags of candy everywhere, <laughs> and he decided that he's gonna give up. But he also thought it was bad, bad for his teeth. So I think that the, even you can even get if you can get through to him, you can get through to to anyone. So I, I think there is. But as for large scale studies, I haven't come across any. But there probably are. I, but I, I don't think any, you'd find anyone now recommending high sugar intake. Oh no, that, I understand that. It's I just mean, that it's, we've seen you can see the grades in our morning classes. Mm -hmm. Same same level of kids totally drop. In right. The same right. Test. Right. Right. I mean, it's burned Depending through. It's through your body, and it's not. It's got no sustaining power. So there's, there's nothing like that. Yes? The, uh, as you were pointing out, the uh, transition got the workforce going and, mm -hmm. and made them more productive. Contemporary society, at least in this country, the prepared foods, the uh, prepackaged meals, everything, I mean, it's almost another transition because you have the two income families. And, right. And time is what is lost. Yeah. People need to get back. Mm -hmm. so, I'm not so sure how quickly some of those things are going to go uh, away right. uh, when you've got two members of the family working, yeah. the kids are in school, and they all come together, and got to get a dinner done in 15 minutes. Right. And well, I think, um, well, I think that there's been, my, my book stops in 45, and I, I think that um, there is a, an inflection to the transition thereafter. There, there is, a, you know, a rise in chicken over beef, a rise in sort of yogurt over over whole milk, and in, increasing consumption of, of, of uh, fruit, vegetables, and so on. So there is a there are there are and then and, and, and a great rise in ethnic food. So that there are there are many ways in which the, the diet has has shifted. That said, this is this still form this still forms the core of it. And once you've uh, and this stuff. If you think about things like the invention of fish sticks and chicken nuggets, this is like your know, captive bird's eye and so, and so on, and the Cornell professor invented chicken nuggets. The, these, are, these are great moments in the history of, of technology because they, they really enable, they, they enable a, again, a very, very quick way of producing a significant number of calories, and in this, this case, protein. And this, so this is from the 30s, 40s, and 50s. So it's kind of in place, grew up in sync with refrigerated cabinets, in stores, the cold chain, and microwave ovens. This happens more quickly in America. In Britain, the you know refrigeration in the house really only comes in in the in the sixties, whereas in, in the in the US it was happening before. And once you've got that apparatus in place, then it's possible to eat it incredibly quickly. So, yes. During your research, uh, have you looked at advertising, marketing? Because if you're producing this. Mm -hmm. You got to get it out to the masses, yes. and you, the masses have to know that it exists. Mm -hmm. How has advertising through time affected people desiring these things? 
it's, it's a great question, and you really see, I mean, pretty much coterminous with the with the rise of large scale print press in in the middle of the nineteenth century, the industrialization of information. You see food being being advertised, and a very key way in which in which it was initially done was through the use of imperial um, motifs. Imperial heroes were often used to, to market particular foods, and this was then able to this was used to be able to sell a kind of global diet. So you get sort of various forms of cocoa and whiskey, cigarettes, all, all the things that you need to survive, but also also British beef and so forth. But then, when you want to introduce novel forms, novel foodstuffs. It's, it's much more difficult, and the, the British, like most cultures, like most people, are notoriously reluctant to eat new things. So, for example, we talked about importing meat from overseas. Importing frozen and chilled beef was a real issue, because if it was seen as being foreign, it wouldn't, often wouldn't be touched. And so, you get sort of Canterbury lamb, for example, which has come from New Zealand, but it's a place called Canterbury in England. So, you could actually try and trick people. So, so sort of various ways of, of saying this is like this is like fresh meat, but not saying where it's come from. So eventually, that kind of thing becomes normalised. Wartime is actually very, very helpful. One of the good things about World Wars, it's a, it's a good way to get people to change the way they eat, to start eating um, much more margarine, condensed milk, fortified foods during 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 wartime, and you don't need to necessarily appetite during those during those periods. So, I think. Advertising has become, and then after World War II, it becomes incredibly more sophisticated and nuanced. But still, most of the time, you're persuading people to buy something that's made of the same. Like the history of British biscuits. There are millions of different types of British biscuits. They're all made of the same four ingredients. They all taste the same, pretty much. Give or take a few flavors. You mean cookies? Cookies, yes, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. In this food revolution, you, you make sort of focused on, on, on the UK, mm -hmm. did it extend to the British Empire, for example? And, and how, what kind of impact did it have in places like South Asia? Right. Um, well, in South Asia, well, let's, let's talk about certain parts of the empire first. In the, in the white settler parts of the empire, this is, this is the, the same diet. Yeah. It happens. It, it's, Partly because a lot of the stuff is being grown there initially, it's also being eaten there. So, sure. and if you've been to Australia, it's like, you know, it's just beans on toast and brown sauce everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> it's very, very Anglo. And so those, those parts of, of the British Empire remain extremely Anglo. Places like Argentina maintain a very, very high level of meat consumption, although it's cooked in very different ways and, and really yeah. most other uh, things. In terms of South Asia, the, there is more wheat enters the diet as a consequence of this, but a lot of it is being, is being exported. Um, then you have a, a sort of Indian food produced in Britain, which is not the same as Indian food in South Asia. It's a, a sort of a different, a different form. So in terms of, in terms of Africa, there are, there are definitely attempts to, to sell and market these foods. They're, they're, they're somewhat less successful. So the, the short answer is any place where British people settle and form Anglo, Colonists, they take this diet with them, and it becomes very, very durable there. In other parts of the empire, it, it's it's somewhat different. So, Thank you. yes, yes. I'm wondering if you had any insight into how this industrialization of food production had uh, on the effect of alcohol's consumption, production, mm -hmm. and variation. Okay, um, good question. Um, the industrialization of intoxication. Um, <laughs> it's not my phrase, someone else said it, so okay, I can't, I, I, I can't um, say I, I, I made that up. You can say it proceeds in, in, in two different stages. First of all, through the emergence of distillation, which is, in, which is a, a, a originally an Arabic technique, but, by, but it's introduced into Europe in the late 17th and 18th century. This means that you can break through the, the, the natural threshold of, 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 of alcohol level, which is about 18% in some forms of sake. By this point in time in Europe, nobody had drunk anything that was stronger than about 15%. And 
and now by distilling, you can produce gin and whiskey, and then you've got up to 45%. And then you need reasonable capital investments to get the kind of still uh, the equipment to do this. So the first wave of industrialization of, of drinking is, is, in the, is in the gin craze of the early 18th century. There are these Hogarth prints of everyone's drunk and dropping babies everywhere. <laughs> and, and there are various attempts to curb this, and, and they ultimately fail. The next phase is with the, is with the industrialization of brewing. And that you see more in the later 18th, early 19th century. And some of the first sort of steam-powered food plants are, are breweries. And you see this in Germany as well, and all over to the uh, United States. Another place where you see this in happening is in the evolution of, of the bar. Like, just a place where you come in and drink, rather than actually sit down in a chair so that you're drinking as quickly and, and, and speeding up as, as possible. So I think that there would be the two ways in which this happened, marketing and bottles and so forth. Alcohol consumption peaks in Britain about 1870. That's when there's the, the highest per capita alcohol consumption in, in the British Isles. It's dropped since. It's kind of amazing to think it's actually dropped, but it has. So, <laughs> so I'm going to use the host's privilege to ask okay. the last question. Okay. So you just mentioned curry. Right? Yes. And I know that maybe that's more post-war. Yeah. But, so what's the story, though, of, of, of curry mm -hmm. entering the British diet? What is that, what is that, su uh, what is that suggestion of this large sure. story that you're telling? Me? Well, the first Indian restaurant in Britain is, is actually around 1811. So there, there are people, uh, and, and these, are, these are South Asians setting up in, in, in London. It didn't necessarily last too long. There are intermittent ones, but very, very few of them in the 19th century. In the early 20th century, there are more of them. In London, there are also Chinese restaurants in, in Liverpool and London, and then there's a great explosion post World War II. So what you see in in the early cases is it is a certain number of really like chutneys, relishes, and sauces. Which bear in mind, despite the spice trade has been lucrative for a long time. Medieval food was pretty spicy, so it wasn't like this was a, you were bringing something back that people never consumed before. So the, these kinds of sauces are brought back and served in these restaurants. But these are often for South Asians and just a few people who've lived in South Asia. Post-World War II, a completely different situation, decolonization and an influx of people from South Asia and from Northern India, Punjab, Pakistan. And they bring with, with them two very different cuisines, a, a very meaty, Cuisine to kind of get drunk, have a beef curry, kind of that's often Pakistani. So in Manchester, for example, most of the restaurants are Pakistani. But then there is also an influx at this point of, of, of more South Indian food, which is often vegetarian. And this Britain is also a place that has, a, has an unusually high level of vegetarianism, and you're developing from, from the early 19th century. And this explodes after World War II as well. So it kind of ties in with this sort of vegetarian movement as well. So that, that I say, is a kind of loose, potted history of, of Indian food. There's a whole bunch of books and curries out there. If anyone wants to read them. Thank you for that. Um, as, as I indicated, uh, if you'd like email notifications of other lectures in this series, we've, uh, we've got a list back here, and we have some flyers for our next talk, which will be on December 10th in this room, same time, 7.30. Uh, the history of uh, orphanages in Ohio in the 20th century with Professor Reed, uh, Reed Solar. Uh, thank you again, Chris. Thank you again for the